All right, let's get this started. Hi, Dawa. Hi. So uh, I'm talking to you from my home in San Francisco. Where are you? I'm in Palo Alto, not too far away from you, actually. Also at your home. Also at my home, yes. <laughs> the new office. The new office, yeah. So we do actually have a, a, an office, a, a Hugging Face Silicon Valley office in Palo Alto, not too far away from here, uh, which we opened recently. Uh, but uh, yeah, it's it's. I'm still getting used to uh, going to an actual office. I, I really like my home office. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of here to stay. So uh, this is this is really exciting for me because um, for a number of reasons. Uh, one, Hugging Face is one of the most interesting companies today. So especially in the machine learning space, but most especially in the natural language processing space, which is where I work. And uh, yeah, I saw the tweet in January that you uh, sent out uh, announcing that you were the new head of research at Hugging Face. And I've been dying to talk to you ever since. And it's been a good uh, six months. So you've had time to settle in, find your feet, get up to speed, actually maybe make a, an agenda and a plan for, your, for yourself at Hugging Face. So it seems like a great time to catch up. And also, um, a lot of the listeners of this podcast will have heard Thomas Wolf um, uh, from Hugging Face, one of the founders. Is that right? How, wh wh how would you describe Thomas? Uh, he's one of the three co-founders, um, and, and he's our uh, uh, chief science officer. So many on this, uh, in listening to us right now, will have heard Thomas uh, interviewed by Sam uh, three months ago. And so um, this is, a, and he had a lot to say about research. And so it's a perfect time to dig deeper into some of the things that he got into and also to just open up new territory, find out what's on your mind. Um, how's that sound? Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I thought his, the podcast uh, with Tom was really amazing. So uh, if people haven't listened to that, I highly recommend people listen to that too. Yeah. You and I spoke briefly uh, a week or two back and uh, I took some notes. And I want to give you the and the listeners uh, kind of the menu of things that came to mind for me uh, that we could touch on. So big themes. I would love to know more about you as a human and you and Hugging Face. I think a lot of people probably have a, a name recognition for Hugging Face, but probably don't know really what it is. So it'd be good to dig into that a little bit. And then the, the main dish of the course, let's uh, dig into the future of NLP. Yeah, one, th one thing uh, I'd, I'd like to emphasize is that Hugging Face is no longer an NLP company per se, right? So we, we are, are doing a lot of very interesting work in uh, computer vision and speech and uh, other uh, areas of AI. So, so I like to think of Hugging Face as an AI company. Yeah, and so l that's a perfect seg. Let's dig into that. So Hugging Face used to be an NLP company, I think it's safe to say, and it's really been expanding. Um, I looked on Crunchbase. Uh, just to see what the basic stats are these days. Um, it's like uh, somewhere between 100 and 200 people, uh, Series C, and um, based in um, New York officially, although quite you know remote now officially. like the rest of us. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And um, so when you, when you joined, um, it was already transitioning into something bigger than NLP. Yeah. What was, what was your perception of Hugging Face? How would you have described it like before you joined and now that you've joined. Yeah, so I, I've always been been uh, impressed by uh, Hugging Face and, and how it presents itself to the outside world. It's a very open and transparent organization um, uh, where it really is about uh, a community effort to uh, democratize a lot of the tools that everybody uses. Uh, so from data sets to models, uh, so Transformers library, of course, uh, also the hub, which is really a, a crucial part of, of the, the AI ecosystem these days, I think. Um, so I, I've just always been very impressed by it. Uh, and, and so, yeah, that's why I, I uh, chose to join this, this company. Uh, I think it really is a, a special, special place and it really plays a special role in the community. So I, I don't think that a company like... I don't know, uh, uh, Google or Meta could play the same role that Hugging Face plays in this ecosystem. Uh, no, I agree. So I think that's cool. I agree. It's a pioneer with open source. For sure. So um, something else that I really like about Hugging Face is how European it is. And now actually very international. The people are just, they come from all over the place. Uh, did you know any of the uh, core Hugging Face people before you joined? Yeah. So I, I mean, I, I 
met Tom a few times before and I knew Victor and, and a bunch of others, uh, uh, Victor Sen. Uh, but so th it's funny actually that you mentioned uh, the Europeanness. So I'm a European, as you can tell from my accent. I'm originally from Holland, uh, but I live in California. Uh, and I spent some time in the UK and in New York before I moved to California. But Tom, my boss, actually lives in Utrecht in the Netherlands, uh, which is where I studied for my undergrad. Uh, so, so, and he, Tom is not Dutch. But you didn't cross paths during your your years in the, in the Netherlands. No, not at all. I I, I left uh, Holland more than ten years ago, so I don't think Tom's been living there for ten years. So. So it's not a Dutch mafia; it's a coincidence. Yeah, it's a French mafia, if, if anything. So oh, the, really? <laughs> the founders are French, and uh, <laughs> so. Uh, but yeah, and and so in, in terms of the the company at large, uh, what I find fascinating is that we have people, I think, in more than twenty five countries all over the world. So in the science team, we have people on on the west coast, on the east coast of. of uh, the U.S. and in Canada and uh, uh, lots of different places in Europe and in South Korea and so so it's a so it's and Turkey as well. I have a friend in Turkey based in Istanbul. Yeah. Let's see. What is your job? Huh. Uh, good question. I I wish I knew. <laughs> no, it's uh, I I mean um, yeah. So, so uh, broadly speaking, uh, I'm I'm just trying to help uh, the team realize this very ambitious vision uh, that the founders have uh, for the company and for the science team inside the company. Um, so uh, uh, yeah, it's not really a well-defined role. I, I think it, it also kind of depends on, on what stage we're in, in a, a given research project, for example. Uh, so I'm, I'm kind of discovering that as I go along. So the official title is head of research? That's right. And so then comes the question, what is research at Hugging Face? How is it different from research at a university or research at a big company like Facebook slash Meta, which is where you came from before this. Yeah, so we're, we're trying to go for a bit of a different model. I, I think if you want to compare it to to a single place, then maybe something like DeepMind or OpenAI is closer to what we're trying to do than uh, Meta. Uh, so, so yeah, as you mentioned, I, I've been at FAIR for uh, five years and it was a wonderful time. Um, uh, but one of the things that, that was difficult at FAIR was that it's very bottom up, uh, which in theory sounds really nice, but it makes it very difficult to do very big, ambitious projects. Uh, so if you really want to create step change uh, research artifacts, which is what we're trying to do, uh, then you need to pull together big groups of people and then make sure that they're all aligned in, in realizing this vision. Um, and in a bottom up research organization, that's uh, very difficult to do. Um, so what we're trying to do is, is find the optimal place between the bottom-up approach that FAIR and Google Brain and places like that have and the top-down approach, uh, which DeepMind and OpenAI have, uh, where they have a benevolent uh, dictator like uh, Demis or Ilya basically telling people uh, what to do and what the vision is. And we're trying to occupy the middle ground a little bit there and really try to use the things that make us special. So that's the ability to move fast. Uh, uh, the, the ability to work with the community, like we've been doing with projects like Big Science, uh, and to really uh, to yeah to uh, to exploit the things that make us unique. What's the difference between um, Big Science, which is a project involving lots of external people, uh, as many as a thousand are signed up, uh, from what I heard from Thomas, um, probably you know more like hundreds that are active participants on a daily basis, but that's big, and then the research team at Hugging Face. Describe your actual team. What, what would you call the actual research team at Hugging Face? Is it like 10, 10 people, 20? So I think uh, last count was uh, 30, 35 people actually. Okay, big group. Big science is one of the uh, projects we have going on. So I, I can tell you a bit about the other projects we have going on. So one of the, the, the advantages of being at Hugging Face is that it's a super transparent and open company. So I can just tell you everything that we're doing uh, without feeling, uh, you know, feeling bad about it. Um, so, so no secret sauce revealed. Yeah. So, so we have a, a project around um, multimodal models. Uh, so multimodality, I think everyone agrees is, uh, is very important for the future of AI. And when you say multimodality, for those listening in, you're referring to more than just text, more than just uh, images, all kinds of sensory, what we would think of as sensory modalities or information modalities for humans. You're trying to capture that for models, but all at once. Yeah, all at once. So, so I think um, if you look at more recent multimodal work, it's very often just text and images. 
Uh, but uh, there are all kinds of different modalities that you all might uh, want to integrate into one single model. So how, ma how many modalities are you stuffing in? Um, so, so right now it's uh, images, text, uh, videos, and audio, because those are the main ones. And then once you have those, then you can start thinking about other specific modalities, maybe sort of sub-modalities, right? So it's unclear whether code as a modality is a part of text or if it's something else or, you know, so there's all kinds of interesting questions about what the modality really is. So my PhD thesis actually was about grounding meaning in perceptual modalities where I also uh, incorporated olfactory semantics. So you can build a bag of chemical compounds model uh, and uh, build uh, smell vectors essentially uh, and, and uh, do interesting things with that. Uh, so that's a long time ago. Uh, but yeah, there's a lot of uh, potential there. What does the word grounded mean in this context? So let's use NLP. Let's use an example like you have a model that, you know, like GPT-3. Uh, so it's learned how to generate text. What does it mean for that model to be grounded? Yeah, so so I, I was going to say, I think the word grounded isn't really well defined, uh, but uh, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a philosopher by training originally. So uh, I would argue that most things are not well defined. Uh, but in, in my thesis, I make an explicit distinction between referential grounding and representational grounding. Uh, and so I think uh, referential grounding is what people often think about with, with like referral data sets. So those exist in computer vision, for example, where you have to pick out the object. So when someone says banana, then you have to be able to point in the image where the banana is. Uh, but I think the much more interesting type of grounding is representational grounding, where you have a uh, holistic meaning representation of a concept like elephant and you or violin maybe is a better example and, and so you know the semantic meaning of violin you can go to wikipedia and look up what violin is what that means but you also have a visual representation of it and you know what it looks like you know what it sounds like maybe you know what it smells like what it feels like what it's like to play it all of these different modalities are a part of your over overarching meaning representation of the concept of violin. And I think that is the much more interesting type of meaning representation. And so that's the, the meaning we should try to get into machines if we want them to be able to really understand humans. So what are the what are some of the problems you see with today's uh, models that reveal that they're insufficiently grounded? Yeah, uh, so um, I, I don't know if, if we're sure that models are insufficiently grounded. I think that's still an empirical question. Uh, but my hunch, and I think a lot of people in the field share that hunch, is that you need to have some understanding of the world as humans perceive it if you really want to understand humans. Uh, and, and so there's a lot of communication that, that happens between humans that, it, that never really... Uh, becomes explicit. So people call this common sense, for example. So the, the example I always use is uh, coffee and what coffee smells like. Everybody knows what coffee smells like. So I never have to explain that to anyone. And uh, so for that reason, I also just have no idea how to describe the smell of coffee. I don't know if you can try that or like describe the smell of a banana in one sentence. Like you, you've never had to do that because you know that everybody knows what bananas smell like. And if you if you could pull it off, we would call you a poet. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so, or so I, I think you're totally right. So you have to fall back to associations then, because there is no uh, descriptive language for this sort of stuff. And I think uh, uh, this happens all over the place in in uh, natural language communication between humans, uh, and that makes it very hard for machines to learn this stuff just from reading Wikipedia or whatever corpus they're trained on. It's funny you're you're very much coming at this as a philosopher. I could see. There's another angle, which is where I'm coming from. So, you know, I'm at a company that is on the applied side. So, you know, we're, we're using NLP to try and solve problems. And where I see what seems to be the grounded problem is the model clearly, if you just poke a little bit, it clearly doesn't understand what it's talking about. Um, you know, it'll say all the right things. And then you, it reveals that it actually has no common sense understanding of what coffee is. Because it'll say something that's a human would find crazy. Yeah, but uh, so uh, I think the word understanding. What does understanding even mean there? Right? Uh, I mean, so I, I think what you're maybe talking about, and that's so. I think there are two main things missing in our current paradigm. One is multimodal understanding of concepts, and the other is the intentionality with a T of language. So the fact that we use language with an intent to change the mental state of whoever we're talking to, right? So I'm using my voice now to change your brain, essentially. Um, and, and so that intent is, is crucial for real meaning and real understanding. And it's something that doesn't exist in language models. 
Do you reckon that we have to give real agency to systems to, to achieve that, to like have them care about something in a, maybe with reinforcement learning or other paradigms? I think so. Yeah. So I, I don't know if, if agency, I mean, yeah, I don't want to keep uh, like uh, going <laughs> on the definitions, but so agency is also a bit unclear, I think. So it's more, uh, uh, yeah, you, you can model the intent uh, of communication when you're trying to uh, model human communication, you can try to model the intent as a part of the interaction. Uh, so you could think of uh, so the two things I just talked about, you could integrate them in language models pretty easily, right? So you could uh, have a language model that also has a, a multimodal input. Maybe you can put it in an embodied environment where it can walk around. Um, and then uh, maybe you can have multiple of these language models uh, walking around in that world and interacting with each other and other humans. Uh, so if you put all of that together, then I think you get something very close to how humans learn language. Is this where you think Hugging Face is headed? Is this one of the grand directions? This is uh, definitely one of the grand directions. Yeah, so so one of our projects is multimodality. As I said, another one is about embodied learning. Uh, Thomas also talked about this uh, when he spoke uh, on this podcast. Yeah, the way he described it was uh, maybe we need to teach models language more like we teach humans language, which is in the world trying to get things done. Exactly. Yeah. So, so, and, and that's because we want the models to use the kind of language that's useful for interacting with humans. Right. So, so people sort of gloss over it, but this, but the, the reason we want to have natural language uh, understanding and natural language generation capabilities in these models, because we want them to interact with humans. Uh, and, and so, I mean, one of the other things I've been pushing a lot for is a more holistic evaluation of these models where rather than just evaluating them on static test sets, we actually expose them to real humans and we see how well they do in that setting. And as you, as you mentioned, uh, uh, those models very quickly break down if you try to actually do that. All right. So different question. Um, I was really curious. So I consider you a very multilingual person. I mean, all Dutch people are, <laughs> if you've ever met a Dutch person, you've met multilingual people. Uh -huh. And uh, here you are in NLP um, and adjacent, you know, you're, you're definitely expanding beyond that, but uh, you would consider yourself uh, an NLP practitioner. Yeah. I think so. Yeah. Kind of. I mean, I'm, I'm, I've been branching out for a long time, so I would consider myself an AI person. Like, uh, so a lot of my work is multimodal, but it's, it's language first. Yeah. Language is my, my main uh, interest. How frustrating or bizarre has it felt to be a deeply multilingual person in like a time in science where it's just so English dominated, the research itself, the tools down, down to the very data that we're training these things on. And I'm asking this as an obvious seg to this really exciting, you know, project that's underway to perhaps create the first truly multilingual based language model as that's my understanding of the project. But I first wanted to hear just like, you, Dawa, like as a deeply multilingual person, you know, like what does it feel like? What has it felt like to be in this weirdly accidentally English dominated space? Yeah. So I, that's a very interesting question, but I, I don't know if I'm the right person to ask it because I, I moved to the UK uh, for my PhD and then I moved to the US. Mm -hmm. and, and so most Dutch people uh, speak uh, pretty uh, decent English, I think. So so uh, I, I think where the accessibility of language models and the multilinguality of language models where that really matters is for people who are monolingual and who don't speak English. Uh, so, so people, uh, you know, who, who, who can't easily access this technology because it's limited only to English. Uh, but I think that doesn't really apply to most Dutch people because they could very easily switch over <laughs> as you mentioned, but also like using these things to make sense of the world that's not written in English, like. I could tell you how hard it is because that's my day to day is like dealing with Chinese, Russian or other languages, like the tools and the data is far, far weaker. Oh, yeah. Yeah, for sure. And, and I think there's also very, very interesting uh, underlying questions there about um, the, the cultural differences that manifest themselves in languages. So uh, uh, English as a language is, is very explicit. So you can be relatively low context in how you communicate. Um, so you're just very explicit or, or, you know, some people would consider Americans relatively blunt, I think, in how they communicate. Same for Dutch people, by the way. Uh, but if you think about like Japanese language, which is very sort of indirect and, and uh, 
uh, very, very different in a sense from, from English. I think that also manifests itself in the culture. So maybe, maybe there are just things that you can't really capture about Japanese culture because you have a specific type of, of language model. So tell us a bit about the ongoing experiment to make a truly multilingual model. Yeah, so the, this is the, the big science model. Uh, it has a name now. It's called Bloom, uh, which I think is a, a, a really nice name because the, the logo of big science has, has also always been a flower. Uh, so the flower is starting to bloom. Um, and uh, uh, so this language model, it's, as you said, the first uh, big multilingual language model. Um, and uh, it is uh, only a few weeks away from uh, being done training. So it's, uh, it's been very cool. You can just follow it on Twitter. There's a, a regular uh, Twitter update uh, where it's like we're at, uh, I don't know, like 87% or something now. Um, and so, so have you been playing with checkpoints? Yeah, so there, there's a, a something called the, the Bloom Book where uh, people have been able to just submit prompts and then uh, uh, someone would run them and, and uh, uh, store the output somewhere for people to uh, inspect. And so we're releasing some checkpoints soon as well for people to talk to. And then when the final model comes out, it's also going to be released so that, can people, that people can play with it themselves. Cool. Is it a basic text-to-text autoaggressive model? Same architecture as uh, your typical big text-to-text models? Yeah, basically, yeah. So, so it's uh, I think by design that that there hasn't been too much divergence from the sort of standard language model that people are are used to. Uh, but there are some some nifty new things in there. So it uses like uh, LBI uh, uh, for like uh, uh, how to do the token embeddings and things like that. So there are a couple of like nice uh, different things in there. But yeah, the main architecture is exactly what you would expect. Ooh, wait, let's dig into that. Um, a lot of people on this call won't really even know what a token or a tokenizer is. I think this is a really neat part of NLP. This is very much a, like uh, the tools you use kind of talk, but let's just like take a moment. Uh, tell us what is a token? What is a tokenizer? And then like, how did you do it differently with this, uh, this big bloom model? And why did you have to? Yeah, so I, I'm not... I'm not the, the right person to really answer uh, detailed questions about the tokenization of the language model. <laughs> but uh, so I can explain what uh, what tokenization is. So it's basically just how, how do you cut up your, your text? So, uh, uh, you know, a sentence consists of words. So you could just cut it up in the white space uh, and, and just every word is a token. Uh, but uh, that is is inefficient. Uh, so what people have been doing is trying to chunk it up in smarter ways. Because then you'd have like a vocabulary of millions, right? And with multiple languages, it could be huge. Yeah. So, so especially if it's multilingual, maybe you just don't see words often enough to really have a very good understanding of their meaning um, as, or a good representation uh, of their meaning. And so what you can do is you can chunk uh, different segments of words together in smart ways. So, so this is uh, BPE by pair encoding and things like that. Um, and so, uh, there has been a working group in the big science workshop. So it's like a one year workshop is how we're thinking about it. And so, uh, I think there are 40, 50 different working groups and there was one working group, um, working on tokenization. They wrote a very nice survey paper. They did a big analysis of what the right tokenization is. And one of the things. Uh, that they found, I think, also together with uh, other, like the main model uh, working group, is that these alibi uh, uh, positional embeddings uh, that really help. Uh, so this was just an empirical finding. Um, and, and so, so you know, there, there's just a lot of this small research that went into uh, this, this whole endeavor. So why not just go all the way down to the individual character? Why mess with tokens at all? Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, there there have been efforts uh, in this direction, or like uh, so. Back in the days, there were like character RNNs, like before transformers, and people were trying to get this to work. It sort of worked, but it didn't really really work. It was a great way to generate made up silly words. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, <laughs> and uh, but so yeah, uh, I think there's also an interesting possibility there where uh, we reduce everything to the byte level. Um, and so when you think about like Unicode or, or UTF-8 or, or things like that, like in theory, every single uh, character can just be, be modeled at the byte level. And then maybe that's the future. And then maybe you could even like uh, uh, into, put images and audio and everything is just bytes. And so basically you can just have a, a pre-trained byte level model. Um, so I, I think that's a, an interesting research direction. And there's been some work on that, but it, so far it hasn't really... Uh, 
proven to be better than just smart ways of tokenizing your data. So the, I, maybe the real explanation for it not working yet is that we haven't used enough data yet. So maybe we just need even more data as, as always. Sven. Thomas mentioned 800 gigabytes. What does that actually translate to in terms of like, how much of the internet did you grab for this? <laughs> I understand uh, you crowdsourced it. Yeah, so it was crowdsourced uh, uh, with a, a, a big community of, uh, of collaborators who were part of the, this big science effort. Um, and, and so it's not really a crawl. So it's very hard to say like what percentage of the internet is this. Uh, it really depended on the language and the, the, the folks who contributed the data for their own language. Uh, I think some of them also had, had different approaches. So, so it's, uh, it's a very kind of uh, yeah, targeted way of collecting data. And, and that's one of the beauties of this big science effort, right? So I think there's a lot of emphasis on this Bloom model. Uh, but what's also very interesting about the, the overarching endeavor is that we have this data set, which is really beautiful, hand curated by experts in those languages. Um, it has a very interesting coverage of different languages uh, geographically over the whole world. Um, I, I don't know what the latest number is. No, in the 40s or 50s, I think 45. Wow. So this is a huge collection of languages. And it includes like, like low resource African languages and, and things like that. So, so I think that's really great. And so there's the data effort, but then the, like the, the legal side of this, like how do you distribute the model, the governance side of the data itself, uh, all of these, these super intriguing questions ha have just been explored by the community completely in the open. Uh, so uh, it's just fascinating for me. I'm sort of an outsider, right? So this, yeah. So, I mean, uh, me too, in a way, like this started uh, uh, about a year ago, I think, uh, or more than that. And uh, so I've just been following it from the sidelines and I'm, I'm still kind of like not directly involved in it uh, that much. And it's just amazing to see. Uh, so, Okay. Now back to you. So um, here you are six months into your new role at Hugging Face. Give us a sense of like what you thought your job would be when you started and now six months later like how what has changed what's the newest thing that you've learned about yourself and hugging face and the mission you know like what what gets you out of bed in the morning that's changed yeah no it, that's a, a very interesting question uh, i mean uh uh i think the job has been what I expected sort of. So, so I knew going into this, that it's just an amazing team and, and like, we really have some, some brilliant researchers in this team. Uh, so, uh, I was very excited about getting to work with those folks. And, and so that's been really awesome. Um, I think, um, one thing that I maybe didn't really expect is, um, when you're a company like Hugging Face and you're this distributed, um, all across the globe, you have to be very decentralized. Uh, so a lot of the communication happens asynchronously on Slack in public channels, um, which I, I think is great. And, and uh, so Hugging Face really has a unique culture that supports this way of working together. Uh, but if you come from a different wor working culture, like uh, me coming from Meta, uh, that that is quite the transition to make. Uh, and so especially you can't just you can't just go to a whiteboard with people. Yeah. So, so everything is remote, but it, it's not even just remote where you're both like talking to your computer over zoom. Uh, it's like, it, it's remote also in time. So, so one of the things I'm struggling with is just time zone, uh, thing. So I, I, I'm in California, right? So I'm sort of trailing the world. Um, and, and so when, when I wake up, uh, or when my, my son wakes me up at around 7 a.m., then I, I check my phone and I have like a million uh, Slack messages and emails and things to read through. And then usually my meetings start at 8 a.m. Uh, because I need to make sure I can talk to the Europeans. And then they uh, stop working uh, soon after that. And so I'm always kind of like trailing in time, uh, which, is, which is not easy. So you didn't see that coming? I, I was not prepared for that. Yeah, I'm, I'm still still adjusting. But uh, I mean, it's a it's an interesting uh, learning experience. And it's just fascinating, I, I think, to see like where the world is going with remote work. And uh, so this is the, the future way, I think, uh, uh, in which a lot of companies are going to be doing things. So what's it like running and building and nurturing a research team at a startup? I think that's something that people will be really curious about. I think a lot of a lot of people will be familiar directly or indirectly with how a research group, even 30 strong, like you said, uh, at a university works, you know, you've got a PI and 
that PI's job is mostly to get grant money. And then you've got the postdocs who actually run the show. And then you've got like grad students who are ranging from miserable to pretty happy. And then you've got like interns and undergrads. Does it have anything like that structure or is it just a totally different beast? Yeah, no, it's very different. So, so I am definitely not a PI. <laughs> so, um, I, I'm more more uh, a facilitator, I think, uh, or a coordinator. And, and so, we have a very flat, non hierarchical organization. Uh, we do have team leads, so those those would be closer to PIs, I think. Uh, so, like, uh, we have a multimodal project, and it has very clear team leads uh, and you know things like that. So, so my role um, is is more like a sort of serving. Uh, leader where I just try to, to help people the best way I possibly can and to make sure they don't have roadblocks and, and that people are talking to each other and that I'm aware of what's going on. And I try to connect people to the right people and connect ideas to the right ideas. So it sounds like pretty normal management, actually. Um, yeah, but uh, so, yeah, I, I guess you could say that, but it's very different from normal management at the same time, I think, because of how decentralized the company is and because of all of the other things that are just very different from from a traditional management role at like a big tech company so uh, well and also the fact that there's like a thousand strong group of people outside the company that you actually have to work with and coordinate with yeah but uh, so that's just a big science project right so so uh, um i i think i mean you make an interesting point that that one of the things that makes uh hugging face so special is that that the, the community plays such a big role in the company and th that's not just big science right so like if you look at transformers the library and the open source ecosystem and data sets and, and things like that. That's a huge community. And, and all of these people are also contributing actively to making these tools so awesome. Yeah, no, I, I remember the day we first started using your Transformers library at my company, Primer. It was a revelation. You just like, I, 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 can't, under, I can't say enough about how positive the open sourcing of Transformer language models was. And I think Hugging Face deserves most of the credit. Just like, yeah. I, I think one of the, the the reasons that Burke became so popular so quickly was because of the Transformers library or the predecessor, right? So PyTorch pre-trained Burke. I remember uh, I was at a, at a workshop at the Santa Fe Institute. They, they do these workshops where they invite a bunch of people and they talk about some stuff. And Fernando Pereira uh, was there, the, the Google uh, director of research, I think. Um, and he was saying like, we have this thing coming out and it's going to like uh, blow ev everything out of the water. It's amazing. It's going to revolutionize NLP. And like, I've heard people say that before and I uh, never really believed it, but in this case he was right. Uh, so, so Bert, yeah. So it, dro it dropped like, I think two weeks later or something. And then, uh, so everyone wanted to play with it and being in fair, obviously PyTorch was the preferred framework and, and it, took like, I don't know, like a week or two before uh, there was this PyTorch pre-trained bird model that everyone was playing with. So it's amazing. And so I did some snooping. Um, your most cited paper, at least according to Google Scholar, is this 2017 paper on uh, sentence representations. Why I think that's so, so notable is that that's like just on the before uh, side of BERT. So, you know, BERT comes out in October 2018, something like that. And so like, well, a full year before that, you were deep in NLP, solving hard NLP problems. Do you remember how crazy it was when suddenly, like on the other side of that line, when we had language models, all the things in NLP that were really hard and tedious, and you needed so much data to even barely get some performance, suddenly became kind of routine and fun and easy. Like, I'm not, I'm not hiding, I'm not hiding the reality that like, Tons of stuff doesn't work and tons of stuff is still hard, but the, the things that are hard are new things, largely. Yeah, so I, I agree with, with, with that. But so, so to me, as a researcher, it didn't feel like a very abrupt transition, actually. So uh, I think it, that was much more the case for, for NLP practitioners and more applied people trying to use the tools. Yeah, but so for me, as a researcher, I think like the transition uh was was actually very natural right so we were doing things with lstms and then okay transformers uh so lstms didn't really work so you needed attention and uh, so there were so even in infrasent we were also experimenting with self-attention and things like that and then what the transformers paper did is it basically removed the recurrence so rather than having an lstm we did the forward uh just a normal mlp uh, feed forward network and so it turned out that attention on its own is actually okay right so um 
from that, it became natural to try to uh, do this on just language modeling tasks. So that's GPT. And then if you can do language modeling, why not do it bidirectionally? Because we were playing with bidirectional LSTMs all the time. Infrasent is a bidirectional LSTM. So BERT is just a bidirectional GPT. Um, so so it, uh, it, it all was very natural, I think, when it came up. So it felt, it felt naturally from the point of view of like no, understanding the science, but I can tell you from the point of view of people trying to solve, pay, solve problems that people will pay you money for. Oh yeah, for sure. No, no, I, <laughs> It changed totally everything. What, there is an aspect though, scientifically that is new, right? Um, I, I was delighted when this little cottage industry of Bertology suddenly kind of sprouted out of nowhere. So here's the thing, you know, it struck me that, um, Deep learning used to be very much like a branch of mathematics, right? Because it was part of statistics, you know, so like all of ML was just math and it felt like the math world. And then suddenly here we are today with models that are so complicated, they're more like biology artifacts. We're like kind of prodding them and probing them and trying to understand things like how, how the heck does Bert under, you know, does it understand grammar? Uh, to what extent does it do it differently than us? Suddenly, it's feeling more like an empirical science and less like a, a branch of math. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not sure. I'm happy with that. Actually, <laughs> I also think that that this this. Uh, so yeah, I have a couple of things to say about that. Actually, so I, I think this cottage in industry of birdology is interesting because uh, a few years before that, uh, we had a cottage industry in Wurtevec. Right. So word of that kind of blew everyone away. And then there were a couple of ACLs and EMNLPs where just everything was something to VEC. And, 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 and it was all just trying to analyze what word of VEC really did. And so I, I think that's just kind of the progression of science where you have a, a big breakthrough model and then there's some consolidation, right, in the, the sort of Thomas Kuhn uh, paradigm shift. So there's a real paradigm shifting artifact like word to vec or BERT, and then there's a lot of consolidation where people try to understand this better. Um, so I think that's just a, the natural progression and that's just going to continue happening. But uh, about BERT specifically, um, so so uh, we just don't have the, the correct mathematical tools, I think, to really understand what it's learning. And so there are, are some efforts now from like Chris Ola and trying to understand better what transformers are, are really learning. Um, but uh, so we have a very interesting paper uh, called Mass Language Modeling and the Distributional Hypothesis, uh, order word does not matter uh, much or something like that. So what we basically show is that you shuffle, uh, if you shuffle a corpus, uh, and so all of the sentences are not in the right order anymore, and you train a bird model on it, it just uh, does just as well as a regular bird. So you mentioned like, does bird learn grammar? Which seem like weirdly seems to suggest that it doesn't matter. Like that it's clearly doing something differently than humans do. Because if you imagine trying to learn language with shuffled language, it'd be a nightmare. Exactly. Yeah. So, so I, I think, um, yeah, maybe we're also uh, over, um, uh, yeah, I don't know, like oh, thinking that bird is better than it really is, or these sorts of models that they're actually better than they really are. And, and I, I think, uh, like when you think about GPT-3 and how, how much of a splash that made, there's also this, this element that people just uh, have a natural tendency to anthropomorphize everything. Like you do this to, to like your robot uh, vacuum cleaner and thinks that you give it a name, and, right? So that in the, the words of Daniel Dennett, the philosopher, you're ascribing intentionality. Um, and, and so um, I think uh, we do that all the time to everything. And we do it especially to things that produce language because language is essentially the only thing we know that is really, really human only. Um, and, and so when something produces language, we just go, oh, there has to be something uh, brilliant behind that. But very often it's just uh, higher order distributional statistics. It's just clever Hans. That's basically, we, we, we create these benchmark tests and we watch the performance on these tests going up, 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 up. And we attribute, you know, a model like GPT-3 on these language tasks as getting truly more clever. It truly has a deeper, quote unquote, understanding of the task at hand. But then you do these clever experiments like the one you described with scrambling and it reveals, well, surely, actually, it's just using distributional tricks. Yeah, but uh, so I, I don't know. I, I think the jury is still, I wouldn't put it that strongly. I think the jury is still out. So uh, I, I definitely think that there's a, an evaluation crisis in NLP. And uh, I mean, I've been doing a lot of work uh, with lots of uh, folks in trying to 
improve that through things like Dynabench, where where we do a, a, a different, uh, we, we try to rethink benchmarking essentially. But uh, I mean, it's undeniable that progress in NLP has just been insane. Uh, so so if you look at like what what GPT three can do compared to GPT one, um, or or what we can do now with Dolly two compared to uh, I don't know the the earlier text to image uh, synthesis models, it's just crazy how, how fast we're yeah so the progress is real but we should be careful to not not kind of over interpret uh, what what we're seeing so there's still a lot of stuff that so there's a, there's a headline there's a headline going around just this uh week about a researcher from google um essentially attributing sentience to the lambda language model um and i i think that's really to your point like what we're talking about it's it's these things actually know how to work with language and we humans are language machines we're like completely geared towards understanding and transmitting receiving and 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 sending information with language that is the most human information you know intentionality and understand the world around us getting stuff done and so when some mathematical object is doing it it's i i feel it too i can't help it have you ever kind of like had that feeling that you you just like have to push away of like, man, I'm talking to this thing. But what do you mean by a mathematical object? I mean, I think you can argue that your brain is also a mathematical object, or at least you can you know, write your brain as a very complicated... <laughs> you took the bait. I was hoping you'd take the bait. <laughs> this is like philosopher catnip. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, yeah, I don't know. So I think there's a, it's very interesting because... Uh, uh, there's a, a very nice theory of consciousness that says that we uh, take the intentional stance towards ourselves as rational agents, and that's what consciousness is. This uh, strange loop, as Douglas Hofstadter calls it. Uh, so, so yeah, maybe we're we're evolutionarily hardwired to take an intentional stance towards things, and that's why we're so confused by uh, the NLP progress we've been seeing. Does it also hint at a way to achieve uh, artificial intelligence of a more AGI flavor? Oh, you, yeah. So, uh, yeah, I, yeah, I, again, like, I don't really know what AGI even means. Uh, and I, I think it's very premature to, uh, to start thinking about it. And so, so we have a, a philosopher slash ethicist, uh, who joined Hugging Face recently, Jada Pistilli. So she, uh, has, has made this point on Twitter too, I think where, um, there are real problems right now with the deployment of AI. And, and so when we're thinking about the applied ethics of these uh, systems, there are just real things we need to fix right now. And they are much more salient and much more important right now than thinking about AGI and paperclip maximizers and things like that. I agree. I agree completely. There's just, I think actually the biggest problem to solve uh, from an ethics point of view is these systems not working that well on narrow tasks and people over trusting them. That's where a lot of harm can come from. Not from bias, even that's another level of problem. Just like over trusting systems, misunderstanding their limits. Yeah, true. But uh, so, so there, there's a trade off here too, right? So we shouldn't hype them up too much uh, because people will just misunderstand what these systems are capable of. But we also shouldn't under hype them too much. Uh, so Sam Bowman, professor at NYU, has a very nice paper. Uh, where he talks about the dangers of underhyping. So if we all just pretend that there is no progress at all, uh, then at some point we are going to uh, be very surprised when AGI suddenly emerges and we have sentient AI. Uh, so we definitely should think about uh, this stuff. And, and so uh, AI alignment is a very active research area and it's a very important research area, uh, but it's all about finding that balance, I think. Sure. Okay, uh, lightning round. Most exciting things on the horizon um, for research in NLP that you're either working towards now or you'd like to go a little bit further than what you're, you know, just about to ship, just about to publish. Yeah, so I, I'm very excited in multimodality. Obviously, um, I I think that there's a lot of interesting work coming out in semi-parametric models. Uh, where you have a retriever component uh, and uh, some sort of lightweight reader model on top of that retriever. Uh, so there was a paper from DeepMind coming out a couple of days uh, came, that came out a couple of days ago. And the idea, in a nutshell, there uh, is it that these language models are basically frozen in time based on the data you give them, and so we need some way to help them keep refreshing what they understand about the world. Oh yeah, that's just one application. I, I think it's much much more. Uh, so so it's I think it's much more about uh, 
how you learn different things. So, so as humans, we have different kinds of memory. We have a semantic memory and an episodic memory. And so uh, uh, we can, we also have a library and the internet where we can look up stuff, right? So we don't have to store all of it in our parameters, uh, our, our brain. Um, so I think if you do this with models too, where you have a big index, uh, where you can uh, invest a lot of heavy compute in having a very high quality index, then you ca can have lots of lighter weight reader models on top of this. So this is also going to have lots of repercussions, I think, for uh, industry, where if you're a company like Facebook, you want to have a million classifiers from all of these different teams all trying to do cool stuff with their classifier. If they have a big index that they can rely on, then you kind of uh, uh, do the compute in a much more intelligent way, I think. So, so it's about finding uh, the, the mix between the retriever, which will be a big, big sort of language model and the reader model on top, which will also be a big sort of language model. And just for people who are unfamiliar with the current status quo, you, what we have right now is a basically just two kinds of, of information storage. You've got the model itself, which has been pre-baked with just an understanding of language and whatever emerges from that, just basically predicting missing words. And then you've got what people usually call the prompt, which is whatever you can cram into the attention window at inference time. So you can actually put a whole conversation there. You can put example problems. You could do a lot of neat things in the prompt, but it's pretty darn limited, right? It's, it's aside from your pre-baked knowledge that's crystallized, all these things can do is whatever you can cram into the prompt. And what you're suggesting is, hey, maybe we could actually build a whole separate system where they could retrieve knowledge at game time. Yeah, so so there are, there are some interesting models. So uh, I've been involved in a model called RAG, Retrieval Augmented Generation, and there's also Realm from, from Google. And, and yeah, so the basic idea is that you can, uh, so you have your, your language model, which would be parametric, and then you have your KNN, like a nearest neighbor search algorithm, essentially, which is non-parametric. And if you put those two approaches together, you get a semi-parametric model. Uh, and I think there's, there's a lot of potential applications for that down the line. So that's one thing. And then uh, the other thing, so I said multimodal, semi-parametric, and, and I think the other thing that's going to be interesting, and there's a lot of uh, uh, traction happening there now too, is around data-centric AI. Um, so I'm, I'm still rooting for things like active learning becoming much more mainstream, um, measuring our data much more carefully. So, so we have folks like Mick Mitchell in Hugging Face uh, working on uh, data measurement tools and, and things like that. So really trying to understand much better what's really happening in our data and trying to do things to the data or curate the data in different ways so that we can have better models in the end. Yeah, I, I quickly, before uh, calling you, I actually uh, refreshed uh, my knowledge of what um, this data tool looks like. I, it's kind of like an X-ray for data sets. And it's a really beautiful idea. I'm surprised that no one, had, you know, you know, an idea is a good one when you're like, why haven't we been doing this for ages? It's just like all the automatic, obvious things uh, you can measure about a data set that, uh, that's composed of language. Like, let's put that all in one toolkit. And then you can keep adding to it and make it more and more sophisticated. That's the basic idea, right? Yeah, that, that's exactly it. And, and so I think that it's just nice that, so this lives in, in a space, so it, it has a graphical user interface. It just exists, uh, maybe in the longer term, it will be a natural part of the Hugging Face Hub where you can just upload any data set to the hub and uh, start measuring what's actually in your data. And you have a nice interface where you can just inspect it on the fly. Uh, so we have, have a lot of interesting things going on in the direction of evaluation uh, and measurement. So, so I think what's really, crucial when you think about the AI pipeline of the future is that you have raw data, which you turn into data sets and those data sets you turn into models, but you want to measure your data sets and your models, right? You want to understand what's in there and how well they perform. And then you want to, uh, based on your measurement, deploy the best model to production. Uh, so for making making predictions with your model. And so, so measurement is really absolutely crucial uh, in all of the decisions that you're making there, uh, but measurement is also very difficult, and and so uh, that's something that we're we're trying to address. So we have an evaluate library that came out uh, a couple of weeks ago. We have some very exciting announcements uh, coming up soon. I don't know when this podcast comes out; it might already be out by that time. But uh, we're we're working on evaluation on the hub so that you can essentially evaluate any model on any data set using any metric just at the click of a button, so you don't have to do any manual stuff there. 
why, surely people are going to miss having to go and copy paste massive chunks of scikit-learn code into their <laughs> Jupyter notebooks. Come yeah, on, Dawa. Sure they will. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I think uh, like lower, lowering the barrier to uh, uh, doing proper evaluation according to best practices. I think that that's a hugely impactful thing to do, and that's something that Hugging Face is uniquely equipped to do. Uh, so, so that's one of the things I've been excited about also in the science team. You mentioned uh, active learning. I'd love to dig into that a little bit. That's something I've worked with myself, and it's an enticing idea. Just for those uh, listening at home who aren't familiar, you know, usually when you want to make a, a data set to train a model, you, the human, have to select the samples of data from your raw data pool that you're going to gold label and you know train your model on. The idea of active learning, in a nutshell, is let's put a model between you and the data, sometimes the model you're training. And it will decide which ones to put in front of you, the human whose time is expensive and, you know, whose sight is limited and make good choices and try and find the most instructive examples from the data to label so that you get the most bang for buck because no one wants to spend their whole life labeling data. In fact, there's, there's some problems that that's just prohibitive. You literally just can't do it. True positives are too rare, et cetera, et cetera. So, is there some like really exciting new developments in active learning? I, I feel like, like it's kind of like a done deal. Is there is there something new and exciting on the horizon? You think? Yeah, I'm. I'm not so. Uh, I I think it just has a lot of potential. Um, and and so uh, what what you described is a specific kind of active learning. I think where you have an, an acquisition function that scores examples, and you just like decide which example you want to label. But I think. There are extensions of these algorithms where you can think not about the labeling part, but about the pre-training part. So uh, maybe I can pick uh, parts of a, a large corpus that I should be pre-training on now because I know what downstream task I care about in the end. Right? So, so there's a mismatch currently between the pre-training phase where we just do language modeling or so causal or mass language modeling. Uh, and then we fine tune it on something that might be very different from what we're training on. So we're, we don't really know what to train on. So I think if we can connect the pre-training phase to what we know we are going to care about, uh, then you can do very interesting things. And so the way to, to do that selection. So data selection is through an acquisition function, uh, type of thing. So that's why it's related to active learning. Another interesting thing that I've been working on as well with some folks is dynamic adversarial data collection, where you have a model in the loop and, and a, a human is trying to fool the model. And so if you take the, the model fooling examples, or, or so if you take all the examples, including the ones that didn't fool the model, but that are still kind of uh, intended to try to probe the model for a weakness, if you train on that data and you keep updating the model as you're doing the training, uh, so that's the, the dynamic component, then you get a much better model out in the end. So it's like really like 10% uh, better. Uh, so we have a nice paper where we try to do this in the limit over like 20 rounds of natural language inference, and you just get a much, much better model out in the end. So I think the future of data collection, the way we think about it now in the field, um, is, is, is going to be changed a little bit where everything is just always going to be with models in the loop. Uh, and that maybe ties back to this long-term vision of having language models interacting with each other in some environment. But if you can have humans and models together uh, interacting with each other and learning from each other and maybe trying to also kind of probe each other and, and be on the, the decision boundaries of certain things, uh, then you can learn much more efficiently, I think. It sounds like you're describing education, like a school. Exactly. Yeah. 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 So, so, yeah. So uh, in, in terms of education, one of the Im important things is also a curriculum, right? So I think one thing you could do with this pre-training uh, and uh, like the active learning of pre-training and connecting that to fine tuning is you could try to have a smarter curriculum. So your, if your acquisition function changes over time, uh, essentially you're designing a curriculum or you're learning a curriculum on the fly that helps your language model be as good as possible on the downstream tasks that you might care about. Okay. And final question, uh, at least that I can think of, is um, something that Thomas mentioned that intrigued me, which is um, he said that there seems to be something missing with NLP. You know, like we, we're making these language models bigger and bigger and bigger. And yes, we're improving the data and we're getting more data centric. But he, g he gave the impression that he really believes that there's something fundamentally missing. It's not just more data. It's not just more text. And you've hinted at this yourself with multimodality. 
an interaction agency, uh, whatever that means. <laughs> so, yeah, if you if you had to make a guess, ten years from now, like what do you think the paradigm is going to be? Will we even talk about NLP? I, th- I I suspect NLP will be a historical footnote. They'll just be AI, right? And text will be just one of the many crucial developmental raw material for for artificial intelligence. Yeah, but I still think that text will just remain uh, a dominant modality. Uh, so, I, so if, even well, if as it is with at, humans, exactly right. So, so language really is is very crucial. So, I I don't think uh, NLP itself is go, going away, but I, I think um, yeah, in order to get to real meaning, all of these other fields are probably going to be uh, subsumed in, into NLP when it comes to language understanding. Right? Um, so. Um, yeah, I don't know. In ten years from now, I think we're going to have um, very, very different models in a sense. But I think a lot of the the building blocks that we have now are still going to exist in those models. Do you think it'll just be all eventually robotics, either real world and or um, virtual world robots, like taking in all the sensory information? Virtual robots, I definitely buy. But uh, so I, I think for actual physical robots, um, I think. Uh, like learning from that doesn't really scale that well. So I, I think one of the big problems in robotics is uh, sim to real, right? How do you transfer from a simulation to a real environment? Um, and so as our simulations become realer and realer, that problem is going to become smaller and smaller. So so I don't think we need physical embodiment in, in any real sense in order to get to meaning, but we'll probably definitely need virtual embodiment where you have an environment where you can interact with uh, each other, but maybe that env- environment already exists, right? So it, maybe that environment is just the internet, uh, or maybe that environment will come into existence very soon in in the form of the metaverse or whatever you want to call it. Any uh, final thoughts you want to share with uh, tens of thousands of people? I think what, so. <laughs> what, I think one one of the the things uh, that I think is Im- important, and, and that's uh, kind of what Hugging Face also stands for, is just uh, open source and open science. And, and uh, so I, if I were to give any parting thoughts, I, I would encourage people to uh, always embrace openness uh, because that really is crucial to uh, making progress, but also making sure that the progress that we make doesn't end up in the wrong hands or go in the wrong direction. So just uh, for those listening at home, uh, Dawa, where can we find out more about you and uh, what you do? Yeah, so I have a website. It's uh, dawakila.github.io. It has a couple of links uh, to relevant social media profiles. I also have a Twitter account. uh, So that's uh, dawakila, my name. So D-O-U-W-E-K-I-E-L-A. And uh, so I'm trying to be more active on Twitter. I'm still working on that. And I'm Bohannon Bot on Twitter. And you'll see me probably asking follow-up questions uh, out in the open, following your advice. Dawa, thank you so much. This This was a blast. Thank you. Thanks for having me.